I hope you've had a great weekend so far. I know for me, I've had a, a little bit of a crazy weekend. My wife has been uh, out of town. That means I've been with our two children. And um, I want to let you know this morning that they are still alive and they are well. They're doing good. Yes, I have succeeded as a father. Um, but we've been in this uh, series, Romans. Everybody say Romans. And uh, I don't know about you, I've been reading through the book of Romans and it's um, just been blowing my mind. It's been speaking to me in such a powerful way, uh, in such a personal way. And I know that we've been kind of talking about this idea of identity. And uh, personally, if I can share a little bit about myself, I know that a lot of my identity comes from how I perform. And I can be a little bit of a perfectionist, uh, especially when it comes to, pre to preaching or uh, coming up here and standing before you. And I just wanted to share that because I know that that's not my identity. Um, it's not impressing you. It's not what you think about me. But we are children of God. Can I get an amen? amen. And I want to remind you because, uh, again, this is not a performance, but you get to participate this morning in the message. That means that you get to lean in and you get to listen. And I want to begin our time with just a word of prayer that God would speak to us and uh, that it wouldn't just go through one ear and out the other but that it would really change us from the inside out. And so if you would bow your heads with me at this time, and let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful to be in your presence. I am so honored to be in the presence of your children, your sons and daughters, and uh, grateful that uh, we have visitors out there today. And um, I pray that uh, more than anything else, God, that you would open our hearts, that you would remove every barrier. God, that we would remove every distraction that could potentially um, pull us away from the message this morning, and that you would speak to us. God, we don't want to come into this place and leave the same. We don't want to play church, and we definitely uh, just don't want to go through the motions. We want to be men and women who really um, embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ and are changed by it. We do not want to be the same person that we were yesterday, and we want to continue to be more and more uh, like Jesus Christ, and we need your grace and we love you so much. And this is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 We've been in the book of Romans. And uh, this week we're going to be covering a part of chapter 3, 4, and 5. And so I've, I've got a big task before me. And uh, we should be done in about three hours, okay? So let's go ahead and jump in this morning. Romans chapter 5. I want to begin by reading Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says here in verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified, everybody say justified. This is going to be a key word today as we read through these few chapters of Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless... Christ died for you. We were still powerless. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified, everybody say justified, by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I want to preach a message to you this morning that I have entitled, From Guilt to grace from guilt to grace 
I don't know if any of you are like me, uh, but at different points in my life, I have really struggled with guilt. Uh, is anyone honest enough in here to say that you have struggled with guilt a little bit in your life? Amen. If your hand is not up, it's because you're lying. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But it's interesting to me, and maybe one of the most heartbreaking things for me as a pastor is when I talk uh, with people who are followers of Jesus, and when I talk with them, even though they, they follow Jesus, somehow they are still wrestling and struggling with the weight of guilt and shame. That even though they have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are still carrying around this weight of guilt and shame. I think sometimes it's hard for us to believe that God has forgiven us. And other times it's just hard for us to forgive ourselves. But if you are going to follow Jesus, you have to understand that guilt has to go. That guilt cannot be your primary motivation because guilt in some ways can be a good thing. It shows you that you did something that you shouldn't have done. But to be motivated by, be motivated by guilt, well, that's just not the way that God has planned it for us to be. You see, he sent his one and only son into the world not to condemn you. He sent his one and only son into the world that you might be saved. And ever since I can remember, I've never really done well with guilt. In fact, even now as an adult man, I'm pretty horrible when it comes to guilt. I'm one of these kind of people that if I've done something wrong, I just have a hard time living with myself. I just confess stuff. I'm, I'm not good at hiding secrets. And even if I do try to hide, I get caught every single time. I, I just, I hate the feeling of guilt. I just want to get it out. You know, I'm the kind of guy, uh, if I see a police officer, even though I didn't commit a crime, I just go like, hey, I did some stuff when I was 16 years old. Do, do you want to know about it? Like, I just feel like I have to get it out. You know, one time, this police officer, this is a true story, uh, he pulled me over. Uh, I was going about 15 miles per hour over the speed limit. And uh, for some reason, I share a lot about my driving struggles on the, uh, from the stage. Um, don't judge me. And I'm not good ex at excuses with, with cops. I, I just kind of admit stuff. And so this guy pulls me over. And have you ever been pulled over and you knew you got caught red-handed? Like you drove, and as you were driving fast, you look over, see a cop, and you know, you're like, I'm getting pulled over right now. I'm definitely, I'm definitely getting pulled over. And so I already had my license and my registration out. I'm like, just take it, man. Just take it. And he goes, you know, you were going pretty fast. What do you say to that? Yeah, I, yes, sir. I was. I said, did you know your speed? Yes, sir. <laughs> Why were you going so fast? because I wanted to get there fast. Um, why do you want to get there so quickly? Because I deal with impatience. I'm not sure. You must be going somewhere pretty important. Uh, yeah, sort of, I guess so. Uh, where were you headed? To church? Were you running late to church? Uh, no, I just really like to get there early. Um, you know, ever since I can remember as a little kid, I just have this confession thing. I just have to speak it out. And I think a lot of it probably has to do with the fact that I was raised by a good dad. You know, when you have a good earthly father, it really helps you view your heavenly father from a better perspective. And my earthly dad, what I have learned is I can go back to different times uh, when I was a little boy where I had done something wrong and I had guilt in my heart. And I can tell you time after time where I would go to him and I would confess but I learned something very valuable at a young age that every time I confessed to my dad, I always felt better and he always forgave me. You know, I wish some of you could catch this principle because it works the same exact way with your heavenly father. That whenever we are dealing with guilt, if we will confess it, if we will repent of it, you are going to feel better, but even better than feeling better, he is going to forgive you. Can I get an amen? Amen. The challenge is that, you know, God cannot heal what you continue to hide. 
God cannot heal what you continue to hide. And guilt is this thing that comes from crossing the boundaries, crossing the line, breaking commitment, committing an offense. Yet when it comes to this feeling of guilt, what the scriptures will reveal to you and I is that our guilt has less to do with what what we're doing and what we have done and it has more to do with who we are and where we come from. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but all of us have this tendency to want to hide. My kids do it all the time. Every time I come home, their, their first reaction is to hide. Lately, whenever they're feeling something or they feel like, uh, you know, something happened that was unfair to them, they want to go hide. That's just their, their knee-jerk reaction is to want to go and hide. And I believe we have that same knee-jerk reaction. I don't, I don't want to show you my cards. And I definitely don't want to deal with all the stuff that is going on in my life. And so we go into hiding. Have you ever wondered why it is that we love to go into hiding? Just me? Okay. Well, Paul in Romans chapter 5 is going to give us some indication as to why we go into hiding. And ultimately, the way he's going to do that is by going all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. And he's going to reference the Garden of Eden. And the very first human beings on the planet, their names are Adam and Eve. Now this is really important because what Adam and Eve started in the garden is what Jesus finished on the cross. And you will never appreciate what Jesus did until you understand how badly they messed things up. And so many of our problems and so many of our issues go all the way back to the beginning. The reason why you hide is because Adam and Eve hid. And so before we get into Romans 5, you got to see this because it explains so much of what Paul is talking about. And we will uh, just recap it for you if you've never been to church or this is the first time in this kind of setting. But Eden was this garden that God created. It was paradise. It was perfect. And it was a free gift given to Adam and Eve. Adam being the first man that was created and Eve the first woman created. I love the story of their creation because for Adam it says that God came and he took dirt from the ground, breathed into the dirt, and he created a man. What a wild thought, right? That oxygen is important. But the real thing that is sustaining you and the real thing that is giving you life is the breath of God today. And so the scripture says that God creates Adam and Adam has been given dominion over the garden. He has been given rule and reign over this part of God's creation. Quickly, God gives him an assignment. The assignment is to name all the animals. And as he's naming all these animals, God looks down on man and says, it is not good for man to be alone. I think it's interesting that man did not notice that it, was good for, it wasn't good for him. But God looked down and noticed that it was not good for man to be alone. And all the men said, amen. <laughs> amen. Can you imagine if God would have just left us down here alone, a bunch of dudes and animals, we wouldn't even have a language, right? We would be barking at each other, right? Like we would just be like, he said, how are you doing today, right? Like that's how we would be communicating. And so God looked down on man and he said, it's not good for man to be alone. I want to make him a helper. Everybody say helper. And so he put man to sleep, and from his rib he created a helper. Her name was Eve. And pretty much in paradise, that, this paradise that God had given them, he had one rule. He had one rule. Not a list of rules, but rather there were two trees in the Garden of Eden. One was known as the Tree of Life, and the second tree was the Tree of the Knowledge of Good and evil. And he said, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. You can do whatever else you want to do. Just do not eat from this one tree. The scripture says that 
one day Adam and Eve, as they were walking in the garden, they were naked and they felt no shame. And it's important that you see this picture because this is our original state. This is how God created us to be. Not that we would be living and hiding full of guilt and condemnation, but rather we would be fully known, fully vulnerable, fully transparent, with no shame and with no guilt. And one day Eve is walking through the garden and a serpent starts to speak to her. The serpent says, did God really say, Eve, that not to eat from this tree? That's how I see it in my head. See, what the enemy will do in your life is he will try to get you to question God. I didn't say sin against God. I think that's what he hopes it will lead to. Just question God. But this is the starting point of all sin. He'll take it further. He will say, did God really say not to eat from this tree? Don't you know if you will eat from this tree, God knows that you will become just like him? So really what the serpent does is he tempts Eve and he shows Eve that I have a better plan for you than God does. And Eve, why don't you take matters into your own hands? Why don't you become the God of your own life? Isn't that the real struggle of sin? What God wants and what I want? And when you sin, what you're saying is, God, I want to be my king. I want to do it my way. I want to be in control of my life. And Eve, are you really content with this paradise? Are you really content with this gift? Don't you know there is so much more than this? And everything about God's rules and everything about his boundaries and everything about his limit is to restrict you and to stop you. And all Eve has to do is give listening ear to the voice of the snake and she begins to doubt the promise of God. See, sin is not only a behavior thing. Sin is a believing thing. Every time I sin, it is not an indication that I am immoral and evil. That's just half of it. The deeper thing is I don't believe God at his word. I don't believe God at his word. I've got to take matters into my own hands. I need to eat the fruit so I can be like God. I need to watch this so I can feel some sort of intimacy. I need to do this because it's what I want to do. God is trying to limit me. And that is how some of you still view the word of God. You view the word of God as a limiting factor that is still trying to hold you back. When really these things that are in his word are here to protect you and to protect the promise and the future that God has for you. And so Eve eats the fruit. The Bible says that Adam shows up on the scene and he eats the fruit. And the moment that they eat the fruit, I want you to see this, the moment they eat the fruit, sin enters the equation. And the first reaction to their sin is that they notice that they are naked. You're naked, I'm naked, and they go, we've got to cover up. Then they hear that God is coming, and so they run from God and they hide in the bushes. See, when they ate the fruit, God comes to find them, and because they sinned, and because they disobeyed, God has to kick them out of the garden. They are banished from the Garden of Eden, no longer having access to the tree of life. And now the result of their sin is that they will die. Yet the result of their sin did not just have consequences for them. The result of their sin created consequences for me and you. And so what does God do? God creates a new system that is known as the law. Everybody say law. 
The law began with the Ten Commandments and then it grew and grew and grew to somewhere around 600 commands because the law always exposes sin and it always says that you can do more and you can do more and you can do more because the purpose of the law is to try to get you to be like God and to be perfect. But you are not perfect. That's the problem. You're not perfect. And in the law, there was a temporary solution to eradicate your sin. I say temporary because the way that your sin could be covered was that you had to slaughter a lamb or a goat and they would pay the price for your sin. They would die. Their blood would cover your sin, but only momentarily. Why? Because you would sin again. And you would sin again. And you would sin again. And you would have to find another lamb or another goat. And it was this never-ending cycle. The law could not save us. And the law could not heal us. In fact, the law's greatest contribution is that it creates a revelation for the need of a Savior. This is why Jesus came. Because you can never earn your way to Him. So he had to come down to you. And that is the gospel. And this is why God sent Jesus, because Jesus was not an ordinary lamb, but rather he was the lamb of God who went to the cross to pay the price for your sins. Come on, somebody. I wish I could get three grateful people in the room this morning for what Jesus did. I want you to see this because now we're getting into Romans 5. And does anybody remember the last verse Peter read one week ago? Amen. If you don't, that's okay. There you go. He got it. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For there is no distinction. What is Paul saying? He says, it doesn't matter. This was what was going on in the book of Romans. Right? There was this, there was this uh, uh, chasm that had developed between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers about what commands and what part of the law that they should uphold and should, should the Gentile believers be circumcised or should they not be circumcised? Should they hold to the Sabbath or not hold to the Sabbath? And Paul's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, if you're black or you're white, Latino, Asian. It doesn't matter who you are. There is no distinction. Every one of you, and myself included, falls short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. You are not good enough. And I'm not good enough. But good news, Jesus is good enough. And we are justified by this, this grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now this word justified is really important because in Romans 5, Paul is trying to illustrate to you and, and me uh, how we have been justified through Jesus Christ. Everybody say justification. Yeah, justification, well, what does this word mean? Justification means being put into right standing with God through Jesus. Amen. And so when Jesus died, his death satisfied God for the payment of sin. And now when I put my trust and my faith in Jesus, it puts me into right standing with God because Jesus has placed his righteousness upon me. In other words, Jesus has taken his righteousness and put it on me. And so when God sees me, he doesn't see me and he doesn't see my mistakes and he doesn't see my problems and he doesn't see my sin. Rather, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is why right in Ephesians 6, he says you need the breastplate of righteousness. Why? Because it protects your heart. Because you condemn yourself and you have this tendency to go into guilt and to hiding and you need the breastplate of righteousness to protect you this morning. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen? amen. 
And in the middle of this explanation about justification, Paul uses Abraham as an example. We're not going to read it, but this is what he, what he talks about in chapter 4. He uses Abraham as an example because Abraham was not a perfect man. But he believed God and his faith was credited to him as righteousness. I mean, because he believed, God said, you're going to have a child. I mean, the guy's like 100 years old. He's like, okay, <laughs> have you seen me? Have you seen my wife? Right, like this, this isn't going to work. But he believed God. But it doesn't, he doesn't, I mean, Paul in Romans chapter 4, he doesn't go into all, I mean, Paul, I mean, you think about Abraham. While he was waiting for this promise, he slept with his wife's maidservant, Hagar. Uh, you know, when he uh, approached a king, he sold his wife as, as, a, as a sister. Not once, but twice. I mean, he was not a perfect man. I mean, you understand that your relationship with God can never be the product of works. But works, listen, are a byproduct of your relationship with Him. Because listen, if what you believe isn't changing what you're becoming, well, do you really believe? See, we work not to, not to be saved, but we work because we are saved. And so justification is not about being perfect, but about being faithful. Everybody say faithful. faithful. See, if you ask my wife, and she's not here so I can share this, if you ask my wife if I'm a perfect husband, she'd say, yes, he is perfect. No, I'm just kidding. She would not say that. <laughs> if you ask my wife if I am a faithful husband, she would say, yes, I am a faithful husband. And this is so important because as Paul writes Romans 5, he's assuming that we understand the guilt we are dealing with is something that we have been dealing with since the beginning. And you can never be good enough. And in order to get rid of that guilt, we must understand that we have to be justified through Jesus' sacrifice. I want to show you just three blessings as we get ready to wrap up this message in a few minutes. A few minutes. Three blessings that we receive as believers in simply knowing that we have been justified. And so watch this. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, through whom we have gained access by faith. Access by what? By going to Lighthouse Church every Sunday? By going to community group every week? By serving every week in Kingdom Kids? Maybe, I'm just kidding, no. It doesn't say any of that. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. The first thing that you need to understand is that we have we have access to God. We have access to God. Because we are justified, we have access to God. You need to get this in your spirit because maturity in Jesus is knowing that at any moment of your day, you have access to God. Newsflash, you don't need me to get to God. You don't need a leader to connect with God. You have access to God because of the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus Christ. See, it's good news because I don't know what's going to happen on your Monday. And I don't know what's going to happen on Wednesday. But I know this, that no matter what happens, you can stop right where you are and you can access heaven's throne room. And you can know your God hears you, because you, not because you have done all this good stuff, but because he loves you and you are justified. I want our church to know this. I mean, pastors fail you, man. Leaders fail you. I'm not against pastors and leaders. I am one. But I want you to know that you have access to God, not because you did enough good things. You know, I've been reading my Bible every day so I feel like God is really listening to me. No, it's not that God is really listening to you, but because you're reading your Bible a lot, 
you just hear his voice a lot louder. It's just called conversation, and maybe this is the first time you've ever heard him speak to you. You have access to God because you have been justified through Jesus. This is not even my sermon. I stole this from Paul, right? Here we go. Look at the next part. Verse, verse, the end of verse 2, he says, And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. See, because we are justified, we now have daily confidence. We have daily confidence. And if you don't learn this, this is what's going to happen to you. If you don't learn this, every time something bad happens to you, every time something happens to you that does not go according to your plan, you will think that God is trying to punish you. And the problem is, is that a lot of us are mistaking God's preparation as punishment. What if God is not trying to punish you? What if he's trying to prepare you for something greater? But if he, if he doesn't grow your character and he takes you into a new blessing, you will not have the character to sustain you in that place. And if you knew the whole story, you'd be like, wait, wait a minute. Sin entered the equation, everything is broken, and everything is messed up, and there are consequences for all that, but I know because of Jesus that I am justified, and that his righteousness, not based on my effort or deeds, has been given to me. Therefore, I am in right standing with God, and so now I'm faced, that I'm safe, facing suffering, I don't have to wonder or question if God is out to get me. I don't have to wonder or question if God doesn't like me. I know with a firm confidence every single day that every bit of suffering is really an opportunity for me to get stronger and stronger and stronger in my faith. I'm telling you what, you have to face suffering because if you don't walk through suffering, you will never learn the art of perseverance. And if you don't get perseverance in you, you'll never be a person of character. Come on, because you are justified, you now have daily confidence. You have daily confidence. I don't have to wonder if God is mad at me. How could he be mad at me? Could he be mad at Jesus? He doesn't even see Mike. He sees Jesus now. That doesn't give me a a permission slip to go sin and do whatever I want. Romans 6 will talk about that. Don't you know that those of us who are baptized were baptized into his death? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. It's not a license to sin. But I'm in Christ. If this was ever about my effort, then I would have been doomed a long time ago. Some of you in this place are like, yeah, I just don't think I deserve a second chance from God. Uh, you would be good to remember you never deserved a first chance. <laughs> this isn't about deserving. This is about the power of God. And this is the power of what I'm trying to get at because some of you are still living as a follower with, of Jesus with so much guilt and with so much shame and you don't have to go into hiding. You can know that you have been justified Paul continues, this is our last point. I want to read uh, like six verses. This is powerful. It says, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, this is good, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the best people. Oh, wait, no. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this is so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation. 
The third blessing that we see is that we experience the love of God. We experience the love of God. He died for you when you were his enemy. When I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. Not when I was at my best. When I was a long way off, Christ died for me. This weekend, my wife has been away, like I shared in the beginning, and last night I was laying my kids down for bed, and I had this thought that I would do anything for my kids. These are, these are my kids. <laughs> Usually we put up the really nice pictures. Leo has boogers all over his face, and Hannah's hair is not brushed. This is what it looks like most of the time in the meat home. But as I was looking at my kids, I thought I would do anything for them. Anything. I would lay my life down for them. And I think that's just trying to be a good dad. But I can honestly say that as a father today, I would gladly and willfully give my life. I would lay my life down right now for Hannah and Leo. And once again, it's not like, wow, you're so amazing, Mike. Everyone's like, yeah, you should, bro. Those are your kids, <laughs> right? That's just called being a, a good dad. Yet, yet, I don't know. Just try to follow me for just a second. I don't know if like, let's say a known criminal who was on death row, if he called me and is like, hey, Mike, um, listen, I know you follow Jesus and you believe in grace and all, but I was... Uh, Wondering if we could switch places. Like, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, I don't think I could do that. I, I really don't. And yet, that's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't exchange his life for, like, his, his friends and for good people. He exchanged his life for sinners. All right, let's go further because maybe there are other people I would lay my life down for, for sure. Like for sure I would lay my life down maybe for a few other people. Maybe I want to believe I would lay my life down for people I don't even know. I, I, I never have been put in that situation, but I know this. I would never lay Hannah and Leo's life down for anybody. And yet that is exactly what God did. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He gave his son. This is what we call the relentless love of God. It's the one-way love of God. He didn't love you because you deserved it. He loved you because that is who he is. And I love how the scripture says it. It says at just the right time. At just the right time. What was the right time? When you were powerless. On my worst day, he was still at his best. On my worst day, when I was an enemy of God, that is when God laid down his life for me. Why do you think that was the right time? I'll tell you why it was the right time. It was the right time because now all of us know that it's not because of one bit of effort. Not one deed contributed to our justification. But rather it was God, for God, and all about God. He did all the work and we simply put our trust in his finished work. Amen. And as we take communion this morning, See, when I pray, I have this tendency, like, I just feel like I got to apologize to God. First thing, out of the gate. Oh I'm sorry. Because I feel like when I come into God's presence, I see how wretched I am. But we need to remember as we take communion this morning, we did not come into his presence through our own merit, but through his grace. And so before we take communion, I want to leave you with this. I want to encourage everybody in this room, if you haven't done so, to download 
the Romans journal. And I just want to encourage everybody here to read the book of Romans on your own and with your community group. This book, I promise you, this, this book, this letter that Paul wrote will change your life. I want to encourage you, number two, to come next Sunday. Uh, this is so important because if you take one part of Romans and you don't get the whole picture, you're going to be left with an incomplete perspective of the gospel. And so it's really important that you come every week and you keep reading on your own so you can get the full picture. Amen? And number three, if you're visiting, we would love to study the Bible with you. We would love to study the Bible with you and share this message, this gospel of Jesus Christ and how it is good news for you. And if you've been coming every week for years, study your Bible because you need to remind, be, remember, be reminded that if you do not earn your way into a relationship, you're not going to earn your way from this point forward. You need him. Can I get an amen? amen. Let's go ahead and pray for the communion. Father in heaven, thank you so much. And I feel like we should all just be on our knees right now. Because God, it, it, this almost sounds too good to be true. Like we're looking for ways to, like this is just, this is just too good to be true. But it is true. And I pray that this kind of grace that what Jesus did on the cross for us and his resurrection into life, God, it would change us. And that it would remind us this morning as we take communion that we did not get into this relationship through what we have done. It's because of what you have done. And that is why we have confidence. That's why we have access to you. It's why we can experience your love. And I pray that we would not abuse or take this for granted. This is not an opportunity for us to do whatever we want. No, I believe your grace should be the one thing that changes us more than anything else. It's your love. And I thank you, God, for your word this morning that speaks to us. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.